Lyndon McIntyre is an award-winning investigative journalist and natural-born Cape Breton curious cat who can tell a story in print or out loud. He began his media career listening to Cape Breton characters pontificate. Then he went to print journalism and moved on to television where he currently hosts CBC's Investigative The Fifth Estate. In his off time, he pumps out intriguing fiction, some non-fiction. His last book was written from a male point of view. This one called Why Men Lie reflects a female viewpoint. It is my pleasure to welcome Lyndon McIntyre to Studio Four to tell us more. Well, it's a great moment to be here. <laughs> well, it's great to meet you. I can't believe we haven't met before. Oh, I'm sure we have here and there passing mm -hmm. here. On the TV, on the TV, perhaps. So back to those Cape Breton kitchens when you were a little guy. Yes. Listening through the hole in the floor. Yes to the aunties, tell stories, or somebody else, the characters. Mm -hmm. Little boys and little girls want, certainly when I, in my generation, they want attention. And one of the first uh, insights I got was how to get attention. And where I lived, you got attention by making music, play the fiddle or piano or mm -hmm. dance. But I noticed that the most oddball, eccentric people who came in the house, who couldn't play fiddles, but could tell stories, were welcome, and they got mm. the teapot out for those people, or the or the bottle out, and those people sat, and they held the attention of the whole room. And I realized what a great way to capture the attention of grown-ups is to take take something and shape it into a narrative and give it to them, mm -hmm. pass their time. So, are you telling me you can't play the trombone or the fiddle? I can't play any of those things. <laughs> Not musical, but uh, you said, or someone said, Cape Breton kitchens were really the yarn spinning academies of Canada. I think so, and uh, and and you alluded to this period of my childhood when I lived up above the kitchen, and there was a hole in the floor for the heat to come up because we didn't have central heating, and uh, and of course the kitchen was the gathering place. Uh, people came and visited and sat in the kitchen where the stove was, <laughs> right, of course. and uh, and I I got fascinated just c collecting the the daily intelligence of the adult world by just hanging around the hole in the floor and, and listening. And I remember one memorable winter, we had uh, a boarder. He was the young station agent from the railway station, and he was a fiddle player who went on to great renown. I don't know how well he's known out here, but he's famous in Eastern Canada. Buddy McMaster is right. his name. And Buddy McMaster was in the kitchen most nights practicing on his mm. fiddle. So that was another reason for me to be at the mm. hole, getting the entertainment. Yeah, magical times. Uh, Ron James, comedian Ron James, yes, was here uh, last week, and you know him. And we d had a discussion about, are we growing characters today? Well, that's like very, your father, yeah. the uh, hard rock miner. Yeah, we're growing characters, but we're not growing very many originals. And this mm. is, I think, the, one of the problems of mass culture is that, that young people begin to take their cues off the, the mass homogenized culture as opposed to from a cl home or from characters in the community mm -hmm. or just from inside of themselves. Mm -hmm. And if, if, I think if, 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 if there's anything endangered, it is the originality of, of character. And if this is your land, where are your stories? Well, you've told a lot of stories. I have. Uh, the investigative bug, when did it bite you? Well, the first thing that bit me was the need to make a living telling stories. Oh, that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, ba back in the early 60s, uh, the notion of becoming a uh, self-supporting fiction writer or creative person in any field was pretty mm -hmm. far-fetched. Mm -hmm. Get a real job. Get so. a real job. And uh, so, and it was fascinating that the field of newspaper reporting, which is where I started, you sat around every day in the taverns and the bars talking about the great novel. And you were talking about the few examples of reporters who became great novelists, like Hemingway and Brian Moore was the mm -hmm. big was big at the time, and 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 we all had a great novel in us. A great Canadian novel was going to come off out of that tavern table mm -hmm. as soon as we got finished there. Of course, <laughs> that was the Scotch talking. As beer, but Scotch, whatever was talking, but we all had that bug, mm -hmm. and uh, and very few people actually uh, liberated the bug and, and went at it. And I eventually gave up on it. 
But later in life, I, you find in, in the field of journalism and reporting, you're getting thrown out into the traffic of life and experience all over the place, and you're picking up an awful lot of stuff that doesn't really get reported, or it doesn't get reported in the kind of depth mm -hmm. that you would like to take it to. Well, in a novel, I assume, can play with the facts a bit. I can go where journalism can't go, or where mm -hmm. journalism shouldn't go. Well, it also can enable you. I mean, I think journalism, uh, classical journalism, and fiction, and, and, and literature literature all have in common this pursuit of something that's true, mm. some truth about how people live, some truth about the human condition and how society works. All the great literature comes to grip with society and how it works, how it should work, where it fails. And, uh, and this was, you know, when I, when I eventually got the bug to write fiction, uh, it wasn't as a sort of a change in direction or a change in career. It was mm. like, this is just another way for me to do what I've always been doing. And how easy is it for you to do it? You talk to authors yeah. often, as you know, who say, this book had me in its clutches, I couldn't spit it out, took me eight years to write it, finally it started to come to me in the last mm -hmm. chapter. Well, there's the two, the two phases, the easy phase is getting the idea and getting the sense, okay, I've got a book to write mm -hmm. and it's going to be about this particular idea I have or this particular situation that I have to untangle. There's a lot of craft there's a, there's a lot of technique mm -hmm. that we don't think a whole lot about. We, we're all readers, and, and a really good book, a good novel, doesn't show the work, the craftsmanship that goes into it. So, so we read these things, and we take for granted that they just kind of spill out. Sure. What about a good title? A good title doesn't just spill out. A good title, <laughs> a good title has to somehow capture what the thing is about. Mm -hmm. It has to be interesting. Uh, this, this <laughs> Why Men Lie, everybody gets completely caught up in that. A lot of people think it's a self-help book. Well, yes, and we want to answer the question immediately because we all have a theory but, uh, about why men lie and then do they lie and do yeah. they always lie. But I, I wrote the book with, the, with a different title in it. I was going to call it Impotence <laughs> until my wife said, do you think anybody's going to carry around a book right. with that on the cover? I don't mm -mm. think so. I said it's what the book, the book is really about men being terribly concerned about this question of impotence in, in the broad sense. Yes. In every sense of the word, mm -hmm. uh, which is what happens to men at middle age. So I had that title in mind. Well, this is about men getting, getting sure. kind of anxious right. and, and insecure at middle mm -hmm. age. And you can be emotionally impotent and yeah. impotent in you physical can be ways and all of that. Economically, emotionally, and physically. Mm -hmm. And it all, it's all something you have to come to grips with at middle age, if you, as a man in particular. Sure. I hear tell. You hear tell. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, your wife said, don't do it, don't no, go no, there. So who came idea. up with Why Men Lie? I did. I was, uh, I'd gone through, I'd, after dismissing the impotence title, for good mm -hmm. reasons, I realized, I came up with a sort of airy fairy poetry kind of thing, because there's a lot of T.S. Eliot in that mm -hmm. book. So I plucked one of those meaningful phrases out. Of course, and like four said, quartets yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. Pulled a little phrase mm -hmm. out of the four quartets and then somebody says, what does that mean? Right. Well, doesn't ha does it have to mean something? So, uh, yes, it really does have to mean something because, you, you, you know, you have to mm -hmm. sell the book mm -hmm. and that's the package. That's the, that's the label on the can of beans. But sure. And you so, want people to talk back to you like, well, women lie too, you Yeah, know. exactly. And, uh, yeah, exactly. And so I, I, anyway, I was sitting there saying, what is the book really about? It was about men insecure, fearing impotence of various kinds, and what they do about it. Mm -hmm. And what they do about it is deceive and dissemble and lie to the people they need to turn to for help. So the biggest lie is why we lie? The biggest lie is why we lie. Mm. Because we're not good at it. We're not good at, we're not good at saying what we need. We're not good at admitting that we need anything. We're not even good at admitting that we need directions from getting out of town or into town. Mm -hmm. We're not good at that. So how, how good are we going to be at getting directions from, say, you, a woman, uh, who has experience with men, who knows men, boys, and everything else? How, how great are we at saying, I need directions to get me through the rest of my life? Because, yes. because what I learned about how to be alive is based on primitive notions of masculinity and power. Mm -hmm. And it's slipping away from me. What else have I got? Ah, uh, some reassurance, perhaps. Well, that's what I'm getting. That's what I have to go looking for. Yes. I'm not going to find it inside of myself. Mm, and if I can't get it without lying, then I'll get it some other way. Well, and like, <laughs> there's a, a lot of men will turn to mm. uh, children, little girl, you know, 20 mm. year old women who mm. will make them feel 20 again. Yes. And they'll have to lie to them. But. And then they call us arm candy. I mean, really. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then you get to a point where you're no longer arm candy. <laughs> but you're, sm you're brain candy, you're smart, and, uh, and that's where, that's where mm. you become most valuable to a smart man.